I'm Rachel Deer, host of today's program, COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. This is the July 17th update of DKB Med Radio's Coronavirus Educational Series. Thank you for joining us. This activity is jointly provided by the Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, DKB Med, and the Institute for Johns Hopkins Nursing. Today's program is accredited for ANCC and AAPA credit, as well as AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Please visit our website for complete CE information. To attest for credit, please visit covid19.dkbmed.com. There, you will also find all of our previous COVID-19 programs and have access to other free CE programs on a wide range of topics. The slides for today's webinar and previous webinars can be found under the resource tab. Today's learning objectives are, describe what high flow nasal cannula HFNC is and why it works, discuss how HFNC has been employed in the COVID-19 patient population, describe how the Lifeline team employs HFNC and its rapid deployment of the therapy. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer Incorporated and in kind by DKB Med. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the activity directors, planning committee members, and faculty presenters and are free of influence from Pfizer. With us today, we have Sam Matei, a critical care transport nurse at Johns Hopkins Hospital Lifeline. He will be discussing high flow nasal cannula and lifeline deployment of the therapy. Sam, thanks for your time. Yeah, happy to be here. Like Rachel said, my name is Sam Matei. I'm one of the critical care transport nurses for, for Johns Hopkins, for their transport team, Lifeline. Uh, I have the privilege of working for them. So we're gonna, we're gonna hit on some uh, high flow nasal cannula stuff. Specifically, I'm gonna talk a lot about what we did in the transport environment, but most of it translates to in hospital, whether you're in the ICU or on a floor in the ED, any, any place like that. So sort of the basics of high flow nasal cannula is it, it is, a ridiculously simple setup. It has been very challenging for us in the transport environment, and it took a very long time for us to get sort of a system that would do it, only because of the heating and humidification that we'll get to in, in just a second. But essentially all it is is an air and oxygen blender that basically will allow you to control FiO2 and, and the amount of oxygen that you deliver, a way to heat and humidify the air so that it's uh, not overwhelming to the patient and so that they can kind of maintain their mucous membranes. And one of the things they always taught you in paramedic school or nursing school was that you could never turn a nasal cannula up above six, 10 liters a minute because it would become unbelievably uncomfortable for the patient and dry their mucous membranes out. And this is the way around it. And then a nasal cannula, and we use a large bore nasal cannula that fits the vast majority of their nares. You don't want to have a 100% seal because you want them to be able to breathe out. But I believe it's like a 75%. You're supposed to include 75% of each nare. All of the equipment out there, whether, um, and I have no disclosures, um, I'm going to mention probably a couple different products in the way we've done it, whether it's Vapotherm or the Fisher and Bikel stuff or the Aervo or via a ventilator, they basically can blend anywhere from 21%, so room air, all the way up to 100%, so pure oxygen. And most of them have flows up to 60 liters a minute. Um, and that's really just the amount of flow. We supplement that whether that's 100% oxygen at 60 liters a minute, or we supplement that at maybe 50% FiO2, and we're supplementing that with 50% med air. And then the big thing that we talk about sort of, and when we get to the plurality study, is non-invasive versus high flow and sort of what the differences are. And the big thing is non-invasive increases the anatomical dead space because you're adding a lot of extra pieces similar to a ventilator. You're adding vent circuit and mask and all of this other stuff to the circuit and to the uh, dead space on the patient. And high flow nasal cannula actually decreases that anatomical dead space. So this is sort of that decrease of the anatomical dead space. Um, and thank you to Salim Rizai and the guys from Rebel EM for this, uh, this graphic. But high flow essentially washes out the carbon dioxide and replaces it with whatever FiO2 or whatever we're delivering to the patient out of that anatomical dead space. So the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, the upper airways that aren't contributing to gas exchange. Basically, we provide a continuous flow to those upper airways and wash them out and essentially wash them out to whatever FiO2, whatever gas that we're delivering. 
and we turn them to an oxygen reservoir and it decreases the amount of CO2 that gets rebreathed. So when you breathe out now, the CO2 is in those upper airways. And then when you breathe in, you suck down that portion of CO2 back into your lungs and it dilutes whatever oxygen you're breathing in. So that's what happens with a regular nasal cannula or a non-rebreather is you've got that CO2 topper, if you will, that you breathe in every single time. And with high flow, we're essentially washing that out. So the big thing is it creates a little bit of a physiologic peep. The high flow sort of overpowers the resistance of your expiratory flow and your exhalation, and it creates a little bit of peep. It's not much. It's not a non-invasive or a ventilator, which are closed systems and sealed, but it creates a little bit of peep that helps recruit some lung tissue and uh, helps to oxygenate. And then there's a consistent FiO2. So whether it's a regular nasal cannula, a non-rebreather, a venturi mask, any system that's open and the patient can, their inspiratory flow can essentially pull around your airway adjunct or your oxygen delivery source, they're going to dilute that. So you can take a non-rebreather and turn it up to 25 liters a minute. And if their inspiratory flow demand is 60 liters a minute, they're diluting that down to 40% FiO2 because they're pulling outside air into that mask. They're not getting only what you are delivering, only that 100% FiO2 that you're giving through that non breather. So that's sort of the difference with high flow is we're capturing all of their inspiratory demand. So if they have a 60 liter inspiratory demand, we're actually capturing that. Every single molecule of gas that they breathe in is at whatever FiO2 we've dialed into that system. And then the, the other big thing is because it's heated and humidified, and this is where uh, we've had challenges in the transport environment because essentially there's no heater humidifier that has a battery on it. So you have to have be plugged in. And this is never an issue in the hospital. But that heating and humidifying makes sure that the mucociliary function stays intact. And it also makes it a lot more comfortable for the patient. So if I dry that mucous membrane and the cilia out, they stop kind of moving junk out of the airway. And by heating and humidifying, I keep that intact and go back to normal physiology. So does high flow nasal cannula work in hypoxia? Yep, absolutely. So we've got some studies that, that say it do. The big one being the Florali study that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine. So we absolutely know it works in hypoxia. So the question is, does it work in COVID hypoxia? And uh, we'll get to the slide on that in a couple minutes here, but we think so. Uh, it appears so. Uh, there just hasn't been a whole lot of evidence on that yet. But the big thing is this florality study, and this is sort of what we're using to say it works in, in hypoxia. The primary outcome was intubation rate. 38% of high flow patients ended up getting intubated versus 47 for that standard, and then upwards of 50 for the non-invasive. And so the high flow was essentially 50 liters a minute with FiO2 titrated to whatever you needed to maintain a SAT of 92. Um, the standard was a 10 liter non rebreather running, and then non invasive was anywhere between two and 10 a peep, and then pressure support to deliver a tidal volume uh, between seven and 10 uh, cc's per kilo of ideal body weight. So, my theory here is that the reason non invasive had a, a higher intubation rate is people don't like non invasive. It's much less comfortable than either a non rebreather or high flow nasal cannula. Uh, so, my bet was the therapy was not as effective because people are constantly pulling it off and it's not a consistent therapy. That's just my theory. Uh, so high flow and in COVID, there's not been a whole lot of research. I looked as much as I could find. Uh, there's not a ton out there. There's some anecdotal like case reviews and case reports where they've had people on high flow that were COVID positive and hypoxic respiratory failure from COVID. Uh, there's been some really good success with proning and high flow to keep people off the ventilator. Uh, so big things with COVID, as everybody knows, is they stay on the ventilator for a long time. They tend to do worse if they get intubated, whether that's because they're sicker or whether that's just the intubation and the PEEP and sort of what we do with the ventilator, taking them from negative pressure to positive pressure isn't good for these patients. And we could go into a whole big thing about COVID and the different phenotypes and all that stuff. But high flow seems to be working very, very well in these patients, uh, both anecdotally from what I've seen and talking to people. And then also some of the case, case reviews that I've read. There's not a ton of uh, literature out there just yet because it's a pretty new, uh, new disease. So the big thing and a lot of the reasons people stayed away from high flow nasal cannula was the aerosol risk. So that was the, the evil thing at the beginning of COVID and it still is now is the aerosol risk. And 
with something blowing at 60 liters a minute up somebody's nose, you would think that it was going to be a massive aerosol risk. Well, surprisingly, it's not. It's, it's very interesting. And this, this was surprising to me. And uh, this goes to kind of how we employed it. But 60 liters a minute on high flow, the dispersion distance, and they did this with smoke. So a little bit bigger particle than what we would see with true aerosol, but a good analog was only 17 centimeters. So, and then it goes down from there. If you were only on 30 liters a minute, it's only 13 centimeters versus even a non-rebreather was, was worse than a, a high flow at 60 liters. Not really that much of an aerosol risk. And it's even decreased by a surgical mask over the top of the high flow. So, and then somebody, I remember talking about this in the beginning and somebody quoted the fact that a, a normal human sneeze is something like 200 or 300 liters a minute. Uh, so nowhere near what we get with the high flow. So don't be afraid of high flow in these, in these COVID patients from an aerosol risk standpoint. So I wanted to talk, talk briefly about what we did at Lifeline. We rolled this out very quickly in response to COVID. We have the T1, uh, the Hamilton T1 ventilator. Once again, no disclosures. I think it was right around first of the year, not, not long ago, Hamilton got FDA approval for their high flow setup on their transport ventilators. There are C1 and T1 C1 is sort of the in-house version, and T1 is the, the transport version, but the high flow on that. It was an add-on to the ventilators that we already had, and as a result of COVID, we were able to add that uh, pretty quickly and then train our staff pretty rapidly. Our big thing, like I've talked about already, was the heaters. It's difficult to heat in transport because there's not a heater on the face of the planet that I know of that has a battery. People have rigged up batteries and, and things like that, but there, there's none that are battery, kind of internal batteries. And so as soon as we were in transport or out of our ambulance or out of our helicopter, we were not able to heat and we heat or humidify. And we, we thought that was going to be a problem, but it actually has not been too much of a problem. Talking to our respiratory therapy colleagues and doing it with patients and sort of querying them afterwards, whether that they felt a big difference. Surprisingly, our transports are short enough that we didn't really need the heating humidification. It didn't cause us too much of a problem. And uh, our protocol was to maintain a uh, high flow at whatever it was put on at the outline facility if we were doing an inner facility or we had the option of being able to uh, to start it under medical direction uh, we have an extremely progressive medical director who very rapidly put together a protocol for us and uh, the goal was essentially to keep it under 40 liters a minute and 60 percent fio2 that was sort of our trigger for for badness and a trigger for when we needed to intubate if we weren't able to maintain sats or a uh, pao2 with 60% of FIO2 and 40 liters a minute, that's when we, we started thinking about, okay, does this patient need to be intubated? How long is our transport? All of that other stuff. So I'm pretty proud of how quickly we were able to, to roll that out and get it out to our staff. Our staff responded to that extremely well. And the other thing is it's a pretty simple therapy. It, it really, there's not a much of a learning curve on it. Uh, some buttonology on, on your equipment and just some plumbing on how you set up the different tubes and going from the ventilator to the heater to the patient and all of that stuff. We were able to pretty rapidly roll that out and get it in place. Thanks so much, Sam, for that information. We're going to move on to the listener Q&A. And to submit your own question, please email qa at dkbmed.com. Sam, here's our question. What are some common complications seen in the deployment of HFNC therapy? Um, so not a whole lot. Like I said, it's a pretty simple therapy. As far as sort of deployment of it, there can be some complications with the equipment, things like that. Uh, I have actually not seen too many patients not handle it. Patients are pretty amenable to, to the therapy. It's much better tolerated than like non-invasive or forced intubation. Um, patients don't typically like that. I've only had a couple of patients like want to talk to me while they're intubated. But uh, yeah, no, it's a pretty, there's not a lot of complications with, with high flow. I mean, you can get some, some breakdown if the nasal cannula isn't sitting right, things like that. But, but overall, it's a, it's a pretty benign therapy. Thank you, Sam. As a reminder to claim credit, please complete the evaluation at covid19.dkbmed.com and select today's activity. You'll receive your certificate immediately after. Any questions or issues, feel free to email us at the address listed. To submit questions, please send them to qa at dkbmed.com. That's Q as in question, A as in answer, at dkbmed.com. Don't forget to access our resource center at covid19.dkbmed.com. 
you'll find a range of information, including the latest COVID-19 data and statistics, medical society guidelines, and resources in Spanish. Again, thanks for joining us, and thank you for your dedication to your patients with COVID-19. Sam, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, happy to be here, and uh, hopefully this, uh, this gives people some, uh, some information to take back to their programs and their units, and talk to your respiratory therapist if you're in the hospital about this. There are your points of contact on this, and uh, I think it's a really powerful therapy, particularly with a COVID patient.